In 1971, two brothers, both of them authors, were walking along a beach spitballing ideas for the next novel. At one point, they landed on a very interesting concept. What if aliens visited Earth, but only briefly? They never made any contact with humans, and when they left, they left behind a bunch of alien junk. And this stuff was dangerous, not in the sense that it was a weapon or anything, it was more to do with the fact that this alien technology didn't adhere to the laws of classical physics. Gravity, matter, velocity, light, radiation, time, all of those rules went completely out the window with this stuff. Like imagine a caveman seeing fire for the very first time and not knowing that it burns. He has to touch it at least once to figure that out, just as these characters in this story have to touch these alien objects to figure out what they do and almost all of these objects burn in their own very unique way. This alien junk obviously fell under the purview of the government who sectioned off this landing area for research purposes and forbid entry to the general population. There were, however, enterprising treasure hunters who would sneak into the exclusion zone to pilfer artifacts, selling them on the black market for a modest profit. It was dangerous work since the zone was full of terrors that were quite literally beyond human reckoning, and so they risked life and limb every time they crossed that threshold on a new smuggling run. The nickname applied to the men, brave or foolish enough to enter the zone this way, was Stalkers. The novel was called Roadside Picnic, written by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. It was, of course, inspiration for the 2007 game Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Only there the horrors were unleashed by a radiation incident rather than aliens. Still, it had about it the same idea, an exclusion zone, a set of anomalies that defied the laws of science as we understood them, and a pervading sense of horror that came from being forced to enter a space that clearly was no longer meant for human beings. If you are thinking about playing Pacific Drive and you haven't read Roadside Picnic, I really recommend reading it. It's only short and it adds so much to the experience of playing this game. Pacific Drive is not an adaptation of that book, but if you have read it, Pacific Drive becomes this sort of headcanon adaptation that you are constantly thinking about while you're playing, and it really does deepen the immersion and payoff of everything that you do. Separate to that, even if you haven't read it, the influence that Roadside Picnic has had on Pacific Drive is immeasurable. This really is a game about entering an exclusion zone full of dangerous anomalies that defy scientific reason so you can pilfer resources and artifacts. Only here, you're not a stalker, you're a survivor, hence the adoption of the survival gameplay genre. The resources you collect aren't sold for profit, but are rather utilized to sustain you and craft upgrades, giving you the ability to not only live another day, but to push into the deeper and more dangerous tiers of the exclusion zone where your one chance at salvation lies. But the real kicker is that you don't make this journey on foot, you make it in this. This piece of shit National Lampoon's vacation car that is just as ugly as it is unroadworthy. Applying the bounties of the exclusion zone to its innards and chassis, you will nurse it from derelict wreck to moving monument to science and engineering. Show it love and care and it will love you in return, except when it gets pissy and tries to run you over, but we'll come back to that later. Pacific Drive is arduous. It's a lot of driving. It's a lot of stopping, putting on the handbrake, turning off the lights, turning off the car, opening the door, collecting the junk, opening your trunk, depositing the junk into a box, closing the trunk, getting back into the car, turning on the car, turning on the lights, releasing the handbrake, and slowly accelerating to a top speed of around 40 miles an hour. It is that for 20 to 25 hours, and if what I've just described sounds terrible to you, you are going to hate Pacific Drive. But of course, it's not just that, it's also wonder and terror in equal measure, as the intimidating anomalies swirl about you in all their fearsome mystery. It is genuine exploration and discovery, as you not only map the zone, but catalogue its contents and learn for yourself what each of these things do and what utility they might afford you. It is a thrifty but affecting story about a group of scientists too stubborn to leave and of you desperate to escape. It's also just a brilliantly constructed game. Every part of it is so smartly put together, so thoroughly tested and tuned, so complete. I mean, this is one of the best survival games I have ever played. For sure, no question. I don't think it's quite as good as Subnautica, but it's up there as this too manages to nail the perfect mix of survival, storytelling and organic mission design in a way that less than a handful of games have been able to do. Pacific Drive really does feel like an instant classic. I'm going to be stunned if this doesn't join the ranks of survival game all-timers. It's clearly drawing inspiration from a number of sources, but it's at all times its own thing. It is unique and immersive and mysterious and just cool. I, oh, I love this so much.
Pacific Drive begins outside the exclusion zone. You're a delivery driver, maybe, and as you skirt just a little too close to the wall, your engine shuts off, you're sucked into a void thing, and when you awaken, your car is not only in pieces, but it's floating around you. You have to assume you are now on the wrong side of the wall, and you stumble forward to arrive at a new replacement car that is clearly a pretty big downgrade. It's awful to look at and even worse to drive. You literally can't even properly turn left or right in this thing the first time you drive it, making the journey of only a few hundred feet feel like it takes 45 minutes. Eventually though, you will arrive at the garage, and this is where things start to take shape. You're trapped here in the outer edges of the zone, and the only way to escape is to head towards the center. Of course, you're not quite ready for that yet, and your car certainly isn't either. By making expeditions into the zone, you can map out its major landmarks while collecting valuable resources that you can use to maintain and upgrade your car. The deeper you head into the zone, the more dangerous it becomes, and the careful tension between thorough exploration and pedal to the metal survival is ratcheted ever up and up until it seems impossible to bear. Many survival games are led by their mechanics first and foremost. They may gesture towards a storyline or world building, but the focus is squarely on gathering, crafting, and building. Pacific Drive does not fall into that category. This is a very story-led game. It's all delivered via radio chatter, three scientists who each argue about the best way to get you out of this mess, and it's really wonderfully written with strong dialogue and characterization that leaps out at you despite you never seeing their actual faces. Each of the scientists chose to stay in the zone when everyone else had left. Each of them have lost everything by virtue of that choice. Each of them have an obsession with this place. They hate and love it at the same time, terrified of its destructive power, while also enthralled to its irresistible mysteries. Potential is a carrot on a stick for the young. Illusion to keep you forging on when you should have given up long ago. The pacing of this story and the manner in which it's told is pitch perfect. The radio chatter exposition is always doled out at just the right moments, such that you never feel as though you're suffering through massive grindy spans without any payoff or progress. It's not just the radio chatter though. You'll collect audio logs that tell the history of this place and how it came to be. There are old notes and letters and poems that provide further color. Plus sometimes your actual car radio will just start spewing out creepy shit, reliving some hellish moment of the past, somehow forever preserved in radio wave form. In Pacific Drive, there are so many things pushing you forward at any one time. The sense of discovery that comes from charting new regions of the zone, the push for better car upgrades, the search for new, never-before-seen anomalies and materials, but certainly chief among these push factors is this story, which is both the story of a very cold, indifferent zone full of otherworldly terrors, but also a very intimate story of people, love, loss, and hope. Every single day I still think about how if I had left the zone when we had planned to, I wouldn't have lost Alan. I thought, I hoped that Lim Tech was done killing our own. It's easier for developer Ironwood Studios to tell a story here than it is in most other survival games because this is not a free-form, go-anywhere sort of map or adventure. It is mission-based, meaning that Ironwood can very tightly manage things like mission design, progression bottlenecks, and story pacing. Each mission begins in the garage, where you select a destination from the board. These destination nodes don't appear on the map at the beginning, but arriving at and extracting from each new region creates connections that then open up the next region. So you're leapfrogging further and further forward each time, but you always need to return to the garage at the end of each run. In this way, Pacific Drive can feel almost like an extraction game, and I certainly saw some of that commentary in the previews. And it's sort of true, but when you really think about it, all survival games are kind of extraction type games where you go out and then you bring resources back to a base. It only feels more extraction-y here because it's not a single contiguous world you're moving through and that more broken up mission style structure does feel closer to extraction games than your average survival game does. Related to that, the way that Pacific Drive handles its map is likely to be one of the most divisive aspects of this game. You do open up each region one at a time and you would guess that the next time you head out you jump straight to the last region Region you unlocked and continue on from there, but that is not the case. Instead, you'll need to visit all of the other regions along the way until you unlock a highway, which allows you a straight shot through multiple regions, significantly speeding up the first leg of each journey. But yeah, that process of unlocking those highways can feel a little arduous and repetitive, despite the very clear interventions that Iron would have made to keep it feeling fresh. Regions are not static in their layout and their contents, they're actually very randomized in terms of their topography, their resource locations, and the anomalies present. 
Furthermore, to spice things up even further, each region has a set of active modifiers that change up the zone completely, so one might be blanketed in an eerie, impenetrable darkness while also draining your battery more quickly, which is extremely stressful, trust me on that. Another zone might have acidic waterways, or maybe an effect that causes your car to go rogue, driving away from you after you park it, or maybe even backing up over you if it's in the mood. The randomization of these effects combined with these modifiers is brilliant. And again, when you really think about it, you realize that despite being forced to return to these same locations repeatedly, the locations actually offer more diversity than what your average survival game is able to do. Because retreading old ground is a central part of any survival game. You go back and forth from your base over and over again. You do the same thing here too, only now each new journey feels wholly unique even if you are revisiting the same locations. But that is a rather generous way of looking at it from the perspective of someone who really loves this game and what it's doing. If you weren't so won over by it, I think there's a good chance that you'd feel a bit worn out by this structure in the late game. Some of those later trips have four or five region stops along the way. And while it does make for a grand odyssey where so much can be lost or gained, it could also feel like game length is being padded out when you really just want to race towards that climactic finish line. For me, these longer journeys were some of the highlights because they were reminiscent of the great pushes I recall doing in Subnautica. If you've ever played that game, you remember these moments when it was time to push a new frontier. New unlocks had given you the ability to go where you couldn't before, and unsure of what you might find, you'd stock up on food, water, repair materials, and other essentials, stretching the absolute limits of how far you could travel in a single trip. Pacific Drive's great road trips summon the same feelings, particularly as you prepare to push into the middle and inner layers of the exclusions zone, these missions are true highlights as they showcase not only how smartly developed and finely balanced all of the survival systems are, but also the incredible level design and mission design. This is not just a static sandbox game where you're asked to do fetch quests. Some of these missions where you're crossing the walls and reaching the very heart of the zone, these missions are incredible. Like they have their own set pieces and mechanics and level layouts and narrative and they're just so exciting. They really are. It's a lot of work to get to the point where you're actually ready to cross those inner walls. And when you get there, Ironwood really put on a show for you. It's fantastic. This very human cast of characters, this expertly paced narrative, this cleverly constructed structure, and these marquee mission moments all combine to create an experience that is so rare in this genre. Only a handful of survival games have been able to get this balance right and deliver this sort of experience. And even then, none of them have done it in quite the way that Iron would have here. Pacific Drive is a fantastic gateway drug into the survival genre, one that is demanding and often unforgiving, but also one where the payoff makes every wrong turn and flat tire absolutely worth it. Pacific Drive is a testament to the power of art design over technical razzle dazzle. This is not Unreal Engine 5, it does not have any ray trace reflections, in fact I don't think there are any reflections at all. The lighting model is pretty flat, texture detail is very low, and assets are pretty simple in their construction. But goddamn if this isn't an absolutely fantastic looking video game that cuts such a stark and unforgettable silhouette with whatever it does and wherever it takes you. Pacific Drive is set in the Pacific Northwest, a heavily wooded area dotted with waterways and clearings. The density of the forest is the perfect backdrop for all of this because it has a quality that makes it calm and inviting, but the density of these woods is the perfect place to obscure all manner of secret. It may look beautiful from afar, but who knows what mysteries lie within the thicket. Twin Peaks used this same setting and featured its image regularly, shots of fog sitting over pine wood. Alan Wake 2 would do something similar, trips into and out of dense, foggy wood that was equal parts serene and ominous. Pacific Drive follows in that tradition, and while it's regularly, effortlessly beautiful, that beauty always quickly gives way to all manner of anomalous terror. But you need to understand what these terrors are. This is not a survival horror game. You are not being hunted by zombies or rabid wildlife or whatever. There's actually no creature or entity that will target you specifically. And part of the way that Pacific Drive humbles you is that it makes clear that the exclusion zone does not care that you are there, no more than we would care if there was an ant underneath our boot heel. The forces that exist in this space exist for their own sake and they're wholly autonomous and they don't care about you one way or the other. But they are all of them dangerous in their own way and if you're fool enough to put yourself in their path then that's on you. So don't imagine that Pacific Drive is scary because everything is chasing you, trying to kill you. Instead, it's scary because you know that everything in that environment can kill you, 
and that you shouldn't be there, but you have to be there. Like, remember that scene from Chernobyl where the guys have to get out onto the rooftop and shovel all that radioactive material, knowing that they can only take a few minutes of the radiation before it kills them? That is the terror at the very core of Pacific Drive. The anomalies that you'll discover are so fascinating, I won't spoil many of them because finding, scanning and understanding them is half the game. I remember seeing a tourist for the first time, which is a humanoid mannequin just frozen in place. Were they human once? Maybe. What do they do? Well, nothing, absolutely nothing in fact, but if you drive into them, they will explode, dealing significant damage to your car. What's really fucking scary though, is that they just appear sometimes. Like you look one way and they're not there, and you look again and they are, and you're just like, holy shit, man. Sometimes, very rarely, tourists will appear off screen out of nowhere and they will throw you valuable objects. Like this object will just bounce into your view and then you turn to see where it came from and you see a tourist who wasn't there a second ago just standing frozen in place. And like, they're helping you out, they're doing you a solid, but at the same time, can you fucking not? That is just too creepy for me to handle. The abductors are another very common anomaly. They patrol and will pick up anything beneath them that moves. That can be other anomalies, but it's very often your car. And they don't do anything other than drag your car a few meters this way or that, which is fine if there's nothing dangerous nearby, but if they happen to drag you into a crowd of exploding tourists or off a sharp drop, then you are pretty screwed. There's another anomaly called a left-right, and all it does is mess with your car, make it turn directions you don't want it to, turn your lights on and off, turn your wipers on and off, beep your horn, etc. You're probably detecting a bit of a theme here, which is that anomalies aren't really that dangerous for you, though you can take damage and you can die in the zone, the anomalies are more directed at your car. They're about inflicting damage directly or putting the car in a place where you don't want it to be or literally stealing its components because there's a type of anomaly called a pickpocket which will straight up pilfer the very panels from your car and it's very hard to get it back from them. But the first time that you see all of this stuff, you have no idea what it is. And part of the magic of Pacific Drive is not only discovering this stuff and seeing it for the first time, but then also figuring out what it does. There is a scanning and cataloging system in place with the help of your visor. This allows you to build a database of everything in the zone, and certain progression unlocks in the tech tree are dependent on you first having scanned one of these anomalies. But the scanning logs don't tell you what this thing actually is or does. You still have to touch the fire to see how it burns. So for example, there are these large floating golden orbs, and if you touch them, it turns out that they give you a pretty massive speed boost. And that can be helpful, but it can also quickly put you into a tree with a busted engine if you touch one of these orbs when you didn't mean to. An even better example are these burrowing electrical anomalies who leave behind them a chain of conductors. These create an electrical barrier that you probably just have to drive through on most occasions since they block off a huge area. Electricity will damage your car, but it also has the side benefit of recharging your car's battery, which is a very big deal on some missions that quickly drain your battery or on longer road trips where overall sustain is an issue. So in these instances, you're likely to seek out these anomalies and purposefully drive into them, trading some car damage for some vital juice. There are other examples like this that I won't spoil, but this loop of discovery, scanning and experimentation is so rewarding. You aren't the first to visit this zone, but it feels like you are. You feel like a genuine explorer, mapping this hostile space for the first time, charting and cataloging its mysteries, and then applying that learning to survive. Because bottom line, the zone is dangerous, but it's that unique form of danger that is not centered on the player. It is a more awesome form of power, like Mother Nature's fury, or the deepest depths of the ocean, or the furthest reaches of space. And that last one is a comparison that we will come back to. Mechanically, Pacific Drive is just as well put together and rewarding as the rest of the package is. There's really four things that make it sing. There's the driving, the tuning of its resource economy, the intelligence of its tech tree upgrades, and finally, and most importantly, the tactility of this whole experience. Driving in Pacific Drive is perfect in that the car handles like dog shit even when it is fully upgraded. 
But to be clear, this is not a case of Ironwood not being able to make a car that feels good to drive. It's actually a case of them knowing which exact variables to tweak so that handling reflects the fact that you're driving a dated family station wagon through the equivalent of an interdimensional war zone. Acceleration is slow, turning has this lag to it, tires will skid so easily, and you will just fishtail and spin out regularly. And all of that is when you're driving on good flat road. It gets way worse when you're driving on dirt roads, across country, up and down steep inclines or through waterways. It's so arduous to get this fucking car anywhere. It is work to drive this automobile, even in the best of conditions. In this way, it almost mirrors Death Stranding, where the simple act of walking can be gamified. Something that usually just is an autopilot activity in any other game requires your full undivided attention here in Pacific Drive. Just like Death Stranding, the simple act of walking from one end of the field to another can feel incredibly rewarding, so too is it here with Pacific Drive, where successfully crossing even small stretches of road or country can feel so satisfying and so relieving. Because success in even basic resource gathering runs is anything but guaranteed. You're contending with not only the open road and the risk of driving into a tree, but also the anomalies that are trying to drive you into a tree. On top of that, you also need to manage your car's resources and keep it repaired. And this is where even more of Pacific Drives' brilliance becomes evident, because the tuning of all this and the tension inherent in its resource economy is always so taut, so challenging, but always so fair. So your car absolutely takes damage in this game. If you drive it through an acid cloud, it will take corrosive damage. If you drive it through an electric storm, it will take electrical damage. If you drive it off a cliff and roll it, it will take impact damage. All of this will reduce the durability of the car's panels, so its hood, its doors, etc. But it'll also damage components, like your engine, which can blow a gasket or overheat. Your tires can and will go bald, go flat, or just straight up fall off the car. Your battery will run low, really fast actually, and your fuel will also drain, especially if you leave your car running when you're off scavenging for supplies. Point is, your car is constantly degrading, even if you drive it perfectly, but you can and will mess up a lot and your car will regularly be at death's door. But that's when all the on-the-fly resource collection and repairing begins. The zone is full of resources that you can pilfer from old cars, trucks, research trailers, electrical towers, houses, farms, whatever. You go in there, grab what you can, and then bring it back to craft a new bumper bar right there on the spot. A flat tire needs a sealing kit, an overheated engine needs a mechanics kit, a car door looking a bit flimsy needs some repair putty. The list goes on, but you're always able to find this stuff in the field to keep your car running, and this frantic scramble for survival can result in the absolute best moments in the entire game. I think my most memorable mission was one where I set out for a really long road trip and I really stocked up for what I knew would be a big push. And I had multiple regions to visit along the way before I reached my final destination. And in the very first region I visited, my car got absolutely totaled. But I couldn't turn around, I had to press on. What followed was a run that took over an hour and that saw me slowly but surely make my way to my destination while also, bit by bit, nursing my car back to health, culminating in an incredible finish that saw me driving into the equivalent of a black hole. Giving me the ability to adapt on the fly and survive against all odds would have been so hard for Ironwood to nail because you need to dial in so many factors to make that work. How much damage should your car take when you crash it? How freely should important resources flow out in the field? How much durability should repair putty restore when it's applied? How much fuel or battery is consumed when your car is idling, etc.? Be too harsh with any of this and the game feels unfair and frustrating. Make it too easy and the systems feel unrewarding. Ironwood absolutely got it right and the result is that that road trip, that struggle for survival, became my most enduring memory of my time with the game, helped in no small part by a pretty badass ending to that mission. Of course, it doesn't always end that way. One time, I was at the end of a massive road trip. I collected so many essential materials. I was gonna upgrade the shit out of my car when I got back home, but I noticed that there was an instability storm closing in and you cannot be in that storm. It's like the circle in a battle royale game. And so when I saw this was coming, I started panicking and gunning it to get out of there and driving more recklessly. And while I was doing all of that, I stopped paying attention to my fuel gauge, which hit zero at the precise moment that I was driving through an acid cloud. And that was the end of that chapter. Pacific Drive is always hard, and it only gets harder the deeper you get into the zone, but some of that pressure is relieved by the upgrades you're eventually able to unlock back at the garage. A blueprint machine acts as the tech tree, and by feeding it certain materials and scanning certain anomalies, you can unlock a host of new kit for your garage, for yourself, and most importantly, for your car. 
The garage starts out very bare bones, but eventually you'll unlock more storage space, a material recycler, a place to store car parts that will heal them over time while you're out on road trips, as well as a sewing machine allowing you to craft backpacks, clothing, and other wearables to keep you safe whilst in the zone. The physical representation of each of these garage upgrades is so satisfying, and by the end of your playthrough, it really does feel like you've gone from an outhouse to a proper scientific facility. But none of that compares to how satisfying it is to fix and upgrade your car. When I return from a drive and my car is really beat up, I'm actually secretly very happy about that because I know that I'm about to settle into a good 15 to 30 minutes of straight up car maintenance. And I'm sure some of you are hearing that and you're thinking, really, every time you come back, you gotta fix up your car? That sounds kind of shit. And I get that perspective. I'm sure some people will feel that way, but you just, you don't understand how satisfying it is to be a mechanic in this game. I will say though, that it does take a while for it to reach that point. And a lot of that has to do with the control scheme that is very counterintuitive, at least at first, as well as a set of menus that put a premium on immersion over readability. I spoke about this in my preview where I said that at first these controls can be finicky and clunky and you're likely to feel like you're fighting them for at least the first few hours. That does melt away though and eventually the muscle memory kicks in and it works well frankly speaking. You can see why certain control mapping decisions were made and you come to appreciate them. But like I said, when you first meet them, they feel quite hostile and you need to push through that to get to the point where they click. The menus though, it's nah, they never really become any more readable. You don't really need to rely on them as you get deeper into the game since you kind of know where everything is and what everything does. So they're not such a big deal. But the reason that these menus and this control scheme are the way that they are is that Iron would have made tactility a focus of this whole experience. They want you to be fully immersed in what it feels like to drive and maintain this piece of shit car using thrown together tech and their commitment to those goals pays massive dividends. Fixing and upgrading your car isn't just about pressing buttons and then things magically materialize on your chassis, you need to look at the broken components, find out what's wrong with them, and then decide if you want to fix them or replace them. If you are replacing them, you need to unscrew the panel, put it on the ground, craft the new panel, walk it over to the car, screw it on, and then if you're feeling in the mood, maybe apply a decal or a coat of paint. All the repair tools involve physically applying them to the parts of the car that are in need of repair. When it's time to refill the tank, you take the nozzle off the pump, you put it in the car, you wait till it's done filling, and then you replace the nozzle so your garage doesn't look all messy. It's not just the physical process of fixing and upgrading your components, but also the visual feedback that comes from each of these fixes and upgrades. You can see when something is banged up and needs fixing because it looks cracked and worn. The different panel types you apply to your car all have their own distinct style, which creates a patchwork effect that looks pretty ugly, but it's meant to show what each panel is protecting the car from, be it acid, radiation, electricity, or impact. As for when you're driving the car, it's an equally manual process. Like I described earlier, you need to manually open every door you want to use. You then need to remember to close it again. You need to remember to turn on the handbrake or the car will roll away. The light Lights and windscreen wipers need to be manually toggled. And again, if you don't turn those off while the car is idle, they will absolutely drain your battery very quickly. The map is only viewable from inside the car where you can glance slightly to the right to see it. There is no GPS, no auto drive, nothing. There is just you and the steering wheel and the map and the road. On the one hand, I'm sure some people are gonna find this a bit much, but for me, I love how committed Ironwood were to this idea because when combined with the very challenging handling, it really does feel like I'm driving this car and it deepens my connection to this hunk of junk. And just as another example of how much thought and work I would have put into all of this, let me tell you about the quirk system. So you encounter anomalies and some of them may give you little presents in the form of quirks. These are unusual behaviors that your car exhibits. So for example, I had a quirk where whenever I turned on my car, my windscreen wipers would toggle on. Okay, not a big deal. I'll just turn them back off. But I had another quirk where every time my car lost traction, my hood would pop up so I couldn't fucking see. These quirks will persist until you diagnose them back at the garage where you have to input the conditions that you think lead to the quirk and then the actual symptoms of the quirk. And if you're able to guess it correctly, then you can repair it. But if you don't, then you are stuck with it, at least for a little while. It's a system that's clearly meant to take us back to our first cars, like shitty hand-me-downs from our grandma or some junker we bought from a mate who's upgrading to something better. 
these cars often had little quirks. For me, my car would screech really loudly every time I full locked the steering wheel. To this day, I don't know what that was. Please let me know in the comment section below if you happen to know about cars. But I put up with it for years because I was a broke uni student who spent all my money on beer and parking tickets. Point is, Ironwood Studios understand very deeply the link between a person and their car. And they know how to create that same link here in Pacific Drive. You will feel the subtle changes in handling when one of your tires is bald. You will endlessly scavenge for resources, desperate to not only keep your car on the road, but to improve it. You will toil away in your garage, whispering sweet nothings to your jalopy as you clad it with new finery, and you'll listen closely as it whispers back its secrets to you. When all is said and done, and it's time to say farewell to Pacific Drive, it's the car that you'll miss most of all. And you'll pray that Ironwood Studios have more adventures in store for you, because as dangerous as it is to be on this side of the wall, at least you are there with a friend. Make sure to empty your trunk before heading back out. You'll need the space. During the course of this review, we've invoked many points of inspiration or reference for Pacific Drive, from Roadside Picnic to Twin Peaks to Alan Wake to Chernobyl to Death Stranding. But there's one final comparison that I want to make that I think really ties this all together and makes pretty clear why it is that I love this game as much as I did. That comparison is this. I don't want to suggest that Pacific Drive and Outer Wilds are analogous because they're not, but there are some very striking similarities between the two games that I think are difficult to ignore. Timber Hearth, for example, feels like a small slice of the Pacific Northwest carved into the side of an asteroid with its log cabins and its pine trees. The ship you fly looks like a real piece of shit jalopy. I mean, look at this thing. It's made out of leftover scrap and held together by rusty nails and rubber bands. To fly the solar system in this thing is not easy, requiring a lot of very manual input. I strongly advise against using the ship's autopilot feature as it will usually just yeet you straight into the sun. It's a game about exploration and discovery where you're not the first here, but it feels like you are. It's a game about touching the fire to see how it burns and then using that knowledge to advance you. Most of all, it's a game about entering a place that is clearly not meant for you, full of threats so awesome in their power and scale that they would never and could never acknowledge something as tiny, meaningless, and insignificant as you. Outer Wilds, Subnautica, Pacific Drive. They all do their own thing in their own unique way, but they are each of them about discovering the very nature of worlds too big for us to comprehend and too dangerous for us to belong in. There are precious few experiences in any medium that can humble us in quite the same way. And that's why I'm very confident that Pacific Drive will leave quite an impression on anyone who plays it. Separate from the awe it so regularly engenders, it's also just brilliantly written, brilliantly put together and so brimming with ideas and creativity and personality that you can feel at all times how much love and care has gone into making it. Congratulations to Ironwood Studios on this debut release. It is really fantastic and I strongly recommend it to you.